alaikum, Ramadan Kareem, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Taylor, and I am the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of Faculty at Habib University. I will be hosting today's session with an esteemed panel of guests. Before we begin, let me offer some context to the session and then introduce our guests. During the recent Times Higher Education University Summit 2021, Wasif Rizvi, the president of Habib University, started a conversation on why lifelong learners created by the kind of liberal arts and sciences education that Habib University offers, which focuses on culti cultivating both intellectual breadth of knowledge along with deep knowledge in a particular major is best suited to addressing the professional leadership gap in Pakistan. This session, is intended to continue that important conversation. A report in, uh, issued by the Institute for the Future, IFTF, and a, panel, and a panel of 20 distinguished technology, business, and academic experts from around the world has argued that 85% of the best jobs that will exist in 2030 may not have yet been invented yet. While the future of work is in transition, today's youth face the distinct challenge of preparing themselves for these rapidly changing opportunities. Unfortunately, Pakistan has failed to harness the potential of its youth due to a higher education system that is overly steeped in pre-professional and vocational training. A recent article in Forbes clearly highlighted, highlighted communications um, innovation, creativity, collaboration, accountability, and character as vital traits that employers will be looking for in the future. In such a scenario, the role of liberal arts education, like that provided by Habib University, is critical in nurturing students who can lead Pakistan towards a brighter future. This event also commemorates the life of the late Ali Suleiman Habib, who we lost exactly one year ago this month. Ash, as he was known to his friends, was a founding board member of Habib University. And as a corporate leader himself, he, he, took, he took great interest in the liberal arts approach to building future social and economic leadership. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. And now let me briefly introduce our esteemed panelists. Ms. Sima Kemal, is the Deputy Governor of the State Bank of Pakistan. She is the first woman appointed as the Deputy Governor of the State Bank. Seema has over 35 years of experience in diverse fields of commercial and investment banking, along with corporate financing. She has previously served as the President and CEO of UBL Corp and United Bank Limited. She, she is also a member of the Karachi Education Initiative. Welcome Seema. From the agriculture sector, we have Mr. Nader Salar Qureshi. He is the chief executive officer of Angro Fertilizers. Nader brings with him expertise in multiple sectors across the Gulf Cooperation Council region, Turkey, Australia, India, India the ASEAN region, and the EU. He is also experienced in consulting, private equity, and finance. Welcome Nader, and thank you for being with us this afternoon. From the automotive sector, we have Ali Asghar Jamal, Jamali, the chief executive of the Indus Motor Company, which manufactures Toyota cars in Pakistan. He has, long, has a long relationship with the automobile industry in Pakistan, having worked with Indus Motors for the past 20 years. Thank you, Ali, for being with us. Also representing the banking sector, we have Mr. Mohsen Ali Nathani, the president and CEO of Habib Metro Bank, he is a seasoned corporate banker with over 25 years of banking experience, covering both East Asia and Southeast Asia, the Middle East and the Levant region. It's a great pleasure to have you with us too, Mohsen. Um, from the media sector, we have um, Mr. Navid Sadiqi, CEO of the renowned news and current affairs media channel of Pakistan, Sama TV. Uh, he has extensive experience of managing and developing national media projects in Pakistan. Welcome, Nabi. 
Representing the investment uh, and development sector, we have joining us Dr. Aisha Khan, the CEO of Acumen Pakistan, uh, an important investment fund that invests in people around the world and is focused on finding solutions to poverty. She leads Acumen's work in Pakistan, where she sets strategy, oversees the investing and leadership work of Acumen and spearheads business development efforts. Thanks you for thank you for joining us, Aisha. Um, and finally, uh, from the infrastructure development sector, we have uh, Mahin Rah uh, Rahman. She, uh, I'm sorry, Mahin has not yet joined us, but will join us soon. We hope. She just oh, she is just uh, joined. sorry, just joined. There she is. Hi, Mahin, <laughs> uh, the CEO of Infra Zameen Pakistan Limited. Mahin has 20 years of experience in investment banking re uh, research and asset management. She currently heads Infrazamin Pakistan, a for-profit joint venture which seeks to provide credit enhancing facilities to infrastructure projects. Welcome Mahin and thank you for being with us as well. Let me ask the first question uh, and Ali, I'm gonna direct it to you first, but I'm gonna ask everyone to answer the same question. And if you try to keep your answers to about three minutes, that will um, help us get to all the questions we have for today. So Ali, I'm gonna begin with you. Um, all of you have spent many years in your respective fields, um, seeing the field evolve as you each rose to lead, uh, the orga uh, to lead organizations at the national and international level. What are some of the challenges you face in recruiting a competent workforce to meet the, change, uh, the changing demands of the 21st century workplace? Ali, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, I think, um, you see, the, uh, what has happened over the last few 30, 40 years to our education system, um, the, the, the people that we are recruiting, okay, they have studied their um, main, main things, but the, the system that we are producing our new kids is only on education. Uh, they do not have a broader horizon uh, of, uh, I would say, uh, like, like what Habib is doing, like liberal arts. Uh, that's what has been missing uh, in, in, our, uh, in the people that we are hiring right now. Um, through other, uh, some of the millenniums, yes, um, obviously we have the challenge of uh, uh, issues like work from home, uh, they want to have, they don't want, because we enter in, into an industry uh, which has to be disciplined like manufacturing. So these are some issues that we do face. But primarily, I personally feel that the education system that we have created have to move from education and also being a good human. Uh, I think that has completely been uh, gone away in our system. A uh, lot of other things that I think the people today that we hire interesting is, on, is, is now more on the CSR activities. Uh, that's a big change that I see from past uh, 20 years of hiring. Uh, uh, the students right now are more interested into uh, 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 what are we doing for the society and all these things. So I think those are the challenges. The main challenge, I would see that people are being educated, uh, but I think they, they, they need to be groomed much better. So that's something that has been missing. And I think that that is a big challenge that we are facing right now when we hire people. Great, thanks, thanks, Adi. Um, Seema, you led a NISAP project at HBL. Um, what challenge did you, challenges did you face there or at the State Bank in terms of uh, this question? Seema, your uh, mic is muted, sorry. So um, I'll just move a little bit. I'll be a little bit contrarian actually to what you said. Okay, so I, you know, you're saying how we fit for the 21st century. I would say that our education system, particularly primary, secondary school system, was not even fit for the latter half of the 20th century. You know, and I think these are sort of arbitrary lines. Okay, we've gone on to the 21st century. So I worked in in banking now for 30, 35 years, and the, and we hire at all levels. And I know that you are talking a little bit more about higher education, but, but frankly, even at a teller level, if you get a college graduate throughout that time and it's got worse, they are not functionally literate. And so that, if, if I can say that that is the biggest challenge that 
I have seen. So you hire a teller or a relation manager, let alone a branch manager, um, their ability to think and to communicate other than in stock phrases, because they've been brought up on rote learning, doesn't equip them even for the last century, forget about moving ahead. So I think that is the, more, the most fundamental issue that we face as a country and as we face as organizations. Um, so I think that is the, when you go into middle management and higher management, yes, you can start to talk about whether they should be liberal arts or whether they should be MBAs or, or whatever. But I think the fundamental issue that I have seen, and I've seen these organizations change, right? I've worked the bulk of my life in a, an organization that moved from being a nationalized bank, hugely overstaffed and non-merit-based to a modern merit-based organization focusing on shareholder value or stakeholder value in many ways. But the fundamental issue we face at all levels when we hire is that people are unable to really think or communicate beyond the little, um, shall we say, the way that they've been taught, the way they've been taught just to pass exams. So I think that is the most fundamental issue that I have seen. Um, so I think that our biggest challenges, forget Great. the higher education. Thanks, Seema. Nader, what has been your experience? So Chris, um, if I may, I'd like to answer your question in two parts. One is what the challenge we face, the, the battle in front, and then what, what the challenges as we see them going into future. So we run large scale industrial uh, uh, enterprise much like Kali does. And, uh, and, and we're, we're a very proud part of the Engro group of companies. So our, our, our objectives are twofold, right? To have really good engineers and then to create general managers. That's what we're aiming for uh, over the course of careers. But both of those things are apprenticeship type uh, activities. So we hire fresh engineers from institutes across Pakistan, the best the, the country has to offer. And we end up running them through a one year specialized training program, uh, what, what we call our graduate trainee engineer program. And it's about a year uh, plus. So they actually can be useful to us because the raw college graduate, he, he kind of knows what a pump looks like from a textbook. He knows what a turbine looks like from a textbook, but he's never had any experience of what this thing looks like in person and how it may operate. So that's a year long program uh, where we pay for their training. Uh, essentially, we hire them and we pay for their training before we, we let them close to uh, any of our equipment on a, on a managerial basis. And then the next part is, you know, over their careers, they learn, uh, we try to groom them uh, for, from a general management perspective, we rotate people. But I think, um, and so the challenge that we have today is the, the graduates that we're finding are not functionally competent. Uh, building very much thematically what, what Seema was saying, that, that what our schools or higher education universities are producing are not functionally competent. Even on the management side, we used to have a, a GMP program and we're revamping that now, uh, but they're just not functionally competent. And, and that's the battle in front is, is how do our higher education uh, institutes produce a higher quality of graduate that's functionally competent. But to, from, from our perspective, where we do long-term planning for our people and careers and so forth, at the end of the day, if you look at our own model, right? General management and engineering are talent. A lot of that has been experience-based. You, you learn things, you get good at pattern recognition, you've seen the problem before, you can diagnose it in the future, whether it's engineering or management. But these skills are largely gonna be obviated in the future. So Elon Musk, who has not failed at any earth-moving enterprise that he's done thus far, is working on Neuralink, which will be a, a, a brain implant that then allows you to interface with computer technology. So imagine having the entire this, uh, wealth that Google can provide at your fingertips. So that experience and, and, and pattern recognition becomes less important. 
And so your ability to have the answer, which is what all our careers are built on, is knowing the answer to tough problems or figuring them out. That becomes far less important. And what becomes important is the ability to ask the right questions. And I think that's an area where a liberal arts education really helps because it gives you kind of a holistic perspective across disciplines and hopefully that learning uh, from multiple disciplines enables people to be in a better position to ask the right questions. Because I think going forward, that will be the really important skill set, not having the answers. The answers will be available to you through an AI interface. Uh, and the wealth of human experience will be available on your fingertips. But asking the right questions is will be the talent going forward. Thanks, Nader. That's, that's very helpful. Um, Navid, uh, the, the communications and media industry has changed dramatically over the last couple of decades. Um, what are the challenges you're finding in uh, recruiting a, a capable workforce? Well, you rightly said that electronic media in Pakistan saw a boom just about two decades ago. It was just after 2002 when we saw this mushroom growth of private TV channels after nearly a four decade monopoly of the state broadcaster. Trained people who were familiar with the mechanics of let's say a 24 hour news channel were literally next to none. It took a good part of the next decade and a half people with a background in print media to sort of come to terms with the transition of, from filling a newspaper once in 24 hours to filling the content of six to seven hourly news bulletins in a day. There was a lot of trial and error the, the hurried pace sort of posed a major challenge to a central part of the old guard. And of course, there were major adjustment issues. And then we saw the rise of a new monster, the digital media, where sort of audiences got younger and attention spans even narrower. And now the pace became sort of so frantic that there were severe burnout issues. If you talk specifically for summer, we have two different newsrooms. The TV newsroom, which requires a fine balance of some experienced people, familiar with the sort of craft of telling a human story with brevity and impact at the same time. And of course, the young guns who have the hunger to make a difference with their passion of news gathering. The digital newsroom is a lot younger with the average age being around 26, 27. There is a lot more idealism, a lot more of a cavalier attitude, also a lot more of indecisiveness. The staff turnover is also higher because uh, a number of people haven't really sort of made up their minds whether they really want to take journalism as a career or not. Apart from these, a major challenge for specifically, not just for the media industry, but more so because it compounds it further, is that in the last three years uh, has been the direct impact of an economic slowdown and a retardation of growth, because that invariably affects the advertising spend of the entire corporate sector. Uh, in Pakistan, unfortunately, the financial model of almost all media houses sort of make them completely dependent on direct advertising. So when you have a 35 to 40% reduction in overall advertising spend, all media houses are forced to sort of review their cost structures. And in beginning 2019, there were major cost reductions, massive layoffs running into three digits. So barely had these adjustments been made that COVID-19 happened. So yes, apart from the regular uh, things of finding the right skill set uh, customized for media in the last three years has also a major challenge. Great. Thanks, Naveed. Uh, Mohsin, you've worked across half the world um, over the past couple of decades. Um, what have been the experiences that you've had in hiring competent people? Um, thank you very much, Chris. Um, you see, the, the important thing is uh, when we are looking to hire people, in the past, there was a lot of focus on technical competence. Uh, and uh, over the last decade or so, there has been enormous research that it's not only the technical skills which are critical, other softer skills are far more important. For example, uh, we've all read a lot of material on EQ versus IQ. Uh, and we see that in leadership positions, especially that is far more critical that we have people who have the ability to deal with people um, and work under an environment that are where you know you have to have extensive interpersonal skills. So that is something which has been very, very critical for me in my in my career. Now, simultaneously, there are other things which are which have emerged as very, very key. First of all, um, 
we've seen people who have a positive mindset, who have a, a doer mentality, uh, are the ones who we've seen succeed. These people with a positive thought process. You come across a lot of people who want to do bare minimum work, who will come up with reasons why something can't be done, versus there are people who are always looking for ways how something can be done, even if it's difficult. Sometimes it may not even be possible, but their approach is to find a solution rather than coming up with reasons why it can't be done. So I think that is a, a very, very important aspect when we, when we recruit people. Um, and also a couple of points on, on uh, your original question of the changing workplace, which is important to, uh, to uh, talk about. Um, see, it's a, it's a given that in the last couple of decades, the workplace that we know today is significantly different to the workplace that we all knew a couple of decades ago. People today are far more demanding. Employees are far more demanding. Employees are far less committed in the initial years to stay on with an organization. Uh, all kinds of changes have come into place. A, a greater uh, diversity is expected. And when I say diversity, I'm not only talking about gender diversity, I'm also talking about the thought process, the background that these people come from, educational background, different thought process. So gone are the days when you would only either hire engineers or MBAs or, or depending upon whatever technical skills you need. So a lot of that has changed. The expectations of the workforce, not to talk about the technological impact that we are all seeing in our organizations. So the employees' expectations have become far different than what they were a few years ago. And as a few decades ago, and as employers, if we do not accept to this dynamically changing work environment and not embrace these changes, we will struggle to provide an environment that uh, is able to attract and retain these people. We genuinely believe that once we hire somebody and if they've been able to spend the first three, four years with us, then the chances are that they will stay for a much longer period with us. But it's the first three, four years where you have to make sure that what this new workforce is looking for, we as a successful organization are able to provide for. Great, thanks Mohsen. Um, Aisha, you, you've studied uh, development of business in the developing and emerging markets, and, and you had a, a global leadership development program. Um, what's your view of the challenges in recruiting great leaders? Thank you for the, Chris. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And it's just great to hear everyone's uh, thoughts on this. I'll step back a little bit and talk about, you know, when we think of recruiting, what do we really look for? And this is true across San Francisco, London, Bogota, Kenya, you know, across all our regional offices. And if I really oversimplify this, I think there are two main vectors. The first one, as alluded to Nader, Mosin, everyone else spoke about, it's the technical component. And that's the really easy to define piece of it. Is it, uh, if you're an analyst, can you look at financial statements and make reasonable assumptions based on those. If you're assessing a company for an investment, can you at least figure out how to model cash flow? So those are skills that are baseline requirements. And I would go and you know I'll reflect a little bit more on how Pakistan fits in later, but that's one vector. The other one is, I think we refer to it in various ways. We just call it multidimensional uh, intelligence. And what that is, is really an amalgamation of different skills. It's really solving complex problems. It's working across different types of stakeholders, working with team members who might come from very different cultures and experience sets as well. How do you adapt? How do you show resilience when everything shifts around you? How do you come up with solutions when it's very hard to even articulate? So if the first one is really figuring out how do you answer a question, if the technical component is really how do you answer a simple question phrased to you? This multidimensional piece of it is around how do you even ask the right questions? This is similar to what Nader said. So if we take these two vectors and I step back and I look at how this works in Pakistan, I think on the first piece, on the technical skills piece, our entire education system, broken as it is, and I think it's fundamentally broken in so many ways, but there is an overemphasis of the technical. We don't do it very well at all, but there is an emphasis on this particular type of learning. And so you can find people who can read 
financial statements. I mean, you may not find very many of them because arguably we don't have enough educational institutions doing even this very well, but you can find it and you can sort of even train this, right? Worst case scenario, you can have a program that takes you through these uh, courses. I think the piece around multidimensional intelligence is a harder one to find. And this is where we end up struggling a lot. It's, I don't think our education system equips our students to ask questions. Uh, they are taught how to really just absorb information and regurgitate it often. And this is the type of intelligence that we really, really need. And it's hard to build that. You can find spaces to create it, but it's super hard. You know, you don't necessarily see it on someone's CV. You have to really read between the lines and go through an entire process of pulling that out. And this is, um, I forget whether it was Nader who said this or Mohsin, but this is exactly the type of intelligence we need as we move forward and think of success in this new world. It's, I mean, it's already happened, right? We already have AI automation. We're very behind the curve in Pakistan, but this is now and around the corner. And unfortunately, we're just not equipped along this dimension, so. Thanks, Aisha. Uh, Maheen, how has the hiring challenge and, and maybe even incorrect hiring impacted the, the development of good infrastructure in Pakistan? Thank you, Chris, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think I lift a little bit from Aisha's statements as well, that there are certain requirements, first of all, to get into an institution. And um, in my experience in financial institutions and, and the way hiring is conducted, yes, you have a few things that you look for. But I think beyond that, there are certain qualities that come about uh, of an individual that ensures their progression throughout the institution as well. And a few of those are kind of universal. So when, when we talk about what, uh, what is it that we look for um, in, in bringing fresh graduates on board and then promoting them within an organization, critical thought is a big one. Um, the ability to think uh, rationally in a structured uh, manner in a step-by-step -step approach is certainly another one. Um, a can-do attitude, so finding solutions uh, rather than just simply bringing problems uh, forward. Um, that's a critical one that will help um, you know, individuals get ahead. And then a big factor is also the, 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 the person's ability to project themselves and to communicate well. Uh, because I think without the communication element uh, within an organization, uh, it, it is hard to get your point across and it could be a very intelligent individual, but if they are unable to communicate their thought process, then that will certainly hold them back. Now, I think when I think of universities in Pakistan, there may be one or two maximum that are able to inculcate some of these elements uh, into their student body. But by and large, the emphasis is very much on road learning uh, on an exam based uh, you know, approach, which unfortunately is in my view, very outdated now. And I think nowhere is this more obvious than if we pick up what's happened in the last one year for online schooling uh, under COVID. And all of a sudden you have a student who can go to a university online or can do online classes locally, but then that university has to make that content relevant. Otherwise, what is to stop that student from picking up a university abroad and doing that same course online. There will be a huge, huge difference. So I think the entire schooling system, the entire university system in Pakistan is going to face challenges in the future just by way of competition of international schools who offer similar degrees online. And if we look at the way COVID is progressing, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. So the ability to generate new content in our universities and in our schools has now become, uh, I would say, of an urgency uh, that we haven't really seen before. Uh, so there is not just a need to recognize that students now have options, um, but also they will flow towards those options that give them the best chance at, pro at progressing in their careers, whether that's in institutions or whether that's in entrepreneurship, um, you know, whatever it is that they choose. So I think the challenges are suddenly immense. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's going to take a, a fairly large effort on the part of both financial institutions, um, corporates that do hiring on how to really attract and tap talent that now has access to other, um, uh, other options uh, abroad and retain that talent. Um, I think one of the biggest things Pakistan has faced is that our best minds after a certain amount of time tend to go abroad. 
And uh, because of that, uh, you have a situation where what's left here just doesn't have the uh, ability or has not been trained uh, to really think uh, in, in the manner that is required to lead organizations. Thanks, Maheen. And you've all given us a lot to, to think about here. Um, let me move on to another question, which is uh, around the globe, the value of uh, holistic and well-rounded um, education, one which balances um, theory and practice along with both breadth and depth. Um, it's being advocated, especially by advocates, uh, of those of us who advocate for uh, the liberal arts as a, as, a, as a challenge to the 21st century. But let me ask you all, how relevant do you think that this, these holistic uh, education models, such as the sort, uh, such as the sort that uh, a liberal arts institution such as Habib University offers, for nurturing future leaders um, who can drive uh, workplaces uh, to success in the 21st century, or um, simply what are the key factors uh, that new graduates need uh, to make business successful in the 21st century from your uh, perspective? Seema, I'd like to start with you on this one since you have had experience with uh, young people given your involvement with um, KGS, Karachi Grammar School, and uh, the Karachi Education Initiative. Seema, your um, mic is off. Sorry. I missed it then. Sorry. I think um, I think it's you know I've come from an MBA background, right? And um, and all of and most financial institutions tend to go towards that, and I am frankly quite opposed to it. Mm -hmm. So I. You know, when I went through my MBA and, and giving a bit of personal context, our daughter went to the UK and did history degrees, right? Mm -hmm. She did her first and second degree in history. And when I read what she did, I realized how superficial an MBA is actually, right? You know a little bit of most things and you know the buzzwords mm -hmm. um, and you don't get that ability to think that a history degree or a degree in any of the liberal arts or in, in, in literature or in philosophy. So in the older days, when someone went into investment banking, say in, in the big names in say London, they actually had philosophy and political science, right? They did those PPE things. So I am actually very much in favor of a more holistic uh, education, very much. And now we're at the state bank, for example, we obviously need the technical skills, right? We need people with a very sound background in statistics, in economics, um, and, and accounting, and they build major big models to predict what's going to happen to the economy and so on. So those technical skills are certainly needed, but from a managerial or general management point of view, I would much rather that we got someone with a very good degree in, in, in the liberal arts than an accountant. Because those skills can be taught internally or by, by, you know, by management training programs, but the ability to question and the ability to challenge and the ability to think out of the box, you know, I, I don't really like that term too much, but yes, to innovate comes from a liberal arts, but a true liberal arts. And we have very little true liberal arts. And, and, and I know that Habib University does that well, uh, but our, um, our general education does not really teach the liberal arts well from the questioning perspective. So until we learn to question, until we learn to understand that, that you must debate and you must not have preconceived notions on everything. And I think a liberal arts education equips you to do that. So I'm, I'm very keen that, that that should be there. And uh, my background with education or with, with, uh, with the Karachi Grammar School also be very keen. We would much rather that people did A-levels, for example, in history or economics or rather than accounting and law or computer science. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Because that does not really teach you to think. And that is really what we are lacking. An ability to think logically, to question, to listen, and be open to ideas. So I think it's very important to have that. And I wish we could internally move away in the financial institutions from this MBA accounting analyst mindset more to the thinking mindset. Thanks, Seema. That's, that's obviously music to our ears at the, uh, through our liberal core at Habib, as you know, we, uh, we believe that uh, engineers need to learn philosophy and history and, and uh, computer scientists need to read Fez Ahmed Fez and, and, and great Urdu poetry and, and literature and so forth. And, and uh, those who study philosophy also need to know something about programming. So that's, the, that's, that's really um, great to hear. Uh, Maheen, let me ask you um, how you nurture or think we should be nurturing uh, youngsters to lead in a modern um, developmental uh, workplace. Okay, so I would go out on a limb here and say that I think that 90% of what we do inside financial institutions can be taught. It's not rocket science. Um, and so what we really look for uh, in an individual, whether they're lower level or mid level, is do they understand what they're doing there? As individuals, do they understand their role in the team? Do they understand what it is the company is trying to achieve? Do they have the bigger picture in mind? Uh, because once um, you know you connect the dots as a person, if you can connect the dots in terms of how you fit in to an entire organization, only then can you begin to contribute more value to that organization. Now we all you know work in institutions where there are process flows and everything is very set in a certain way, but I tell you every process uh, can can do with improvement, and it is usually the people in that process that can tell you. If we do this this way, we'll get better like this. And I think that's the kind of uh, logic and reasoning uh, and you know uh, concepts that we are trying to bring into our institution or the ones that I've certainly led. Um, and looking for those people who um, you know may not have that technical background, but certainly can think in a more rounded way. Uh, and it, it's not just about the questioning or the challenging, but also looking for solutions. Um, I think the the, the basic line is that within, within corporates, um, as a junior resource, your job is really to make your boss's life easier. And however you can do that, um, uh, I think you will be recognized for that. So whether it is um, looking at uh, the way things are done and how to improve your own segment of work, or whether it is contributing to the entire team, um, I think that is the kind of uh, approach that we're looking for and certainly I think it's on us as leaders also to encourage um, lower level or mid-level managers to speak up and to be heard in such environments and to actually think beyond just the basics of what they're doing. Uh, because I think once we push that rational thought and that critical thought process, uh, that's when the entire organization really does benefit. Great, thank you so much, Maheen. Um, Mohsin, if we had to pick a sort of an X factor in the, in the education of young people today, what would what would it, the X factor be for you? Well, after um, Seema's comments, I'm somewhat hesitant to admit that I also have an MBA degree, uh, which, which I must say I did find quite useful. Um, but on a serious note, I think what um, everybody is talking about here from a liberal arts perspective is that in today's world, a liberal arts education clearly has become far more important than what it was a few decades ago. The fundamental shift is that if we go back in the old times, there was too much focus on just having technical skills. Today, if you see, there is far greater focus on other skills in addition to having some basic technical skills. So for example, if I look at from a bank, banking point of view, when we interview people, we'll spend very limited time in assessing their technical skills. Right? whether they can analyze the financials, et cetera, that's a very limited time. A whole lot more time is spent on assessing how well-rounded their information or their knowledge base is. How much do they understand about world economics? How much do they understand about politics? How much do they understand how these factors will impact our operating environment, our operating business? So our expectation is actually goes far beyond and far different to pure academic technical knowledge. 
I think that has been the uh, from from a from a educational background point of view. I'm going to first talk about educational background, and then I'm going to talk about the softer things that we look at when we interview people or when we are identifying talent. So, 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 the, so the summary of the first point is that a far more focus on non-technical, uh, soft aspects rather than just the technical. Then the other things that we look at in people is uh, we talked about the dual mentality, but more importantly, we're looking for hiring people from a different economic strata in the organization as well. Yeah, people having a different hunger level uh, from where they're coming from. Uh, uh, a lot of these things are completely different thought process. We, when we hire people, we try and hire people who, who come from across the country rather than one or two or three large cities only because it helps us understand, have, have a pool of talent that has a mindset that reflects the, the whole the, the operating environment of the whole country or the whole nation as opposed to specific geography. So a lot of these things are now taken into account when we are inducting people and the focus on education and within education on the technicalities is, is far, far less than what it used to be. Thanks, Mohsen. Um, Ali, what has been your experience at Indus? Um, you know, before I start, uh, because it's the uh, one year anniversary of Mr. Ali Abi, so what Seema said right now, you know, reminded what he used to tell me. Exactly the same words that in case of MBA, they learn some things of everything. Now, I don't know whether Seema, you told Ali Habib or Ali Habib told you this. So it's just a mystery. I don't know. But he always used to say this. Um, um, you see, for me, only one word is important when I, when I see a fine people. is the attitude. Um, yeah, because the two things which I think uh, both uh, Mahin and Seema said about uh, asking the right questions and continuous improvement. Um, th this is the philosophy of Toyota, right? So it's built in into our SOPs, it's built in into our systems. The most important thing I feel I see is the attitude. Do you have an attitude to learn? Because systems are there. Um, these things are there where, where we can make them think, where we can make them ask those questions. But if the attitude is not there, okay, trust me, um, I find more than 85% people who won't have the attitude while they, well, in an interview, you may find it, right? In, uh, uh, as soon as they start the work, you won't find that attitude. And for me, it's a very simple formula. Now, obviously, uh, as an engineering industry, you need to have a depth in knowledge also. So I, I, I tell my people it's it's n n minus one n minus two n minus three if n minus three you get into an organization um, at that level ninety percent is to learn the work and ten percent is people management you move to n minus two it becomes uh, sixty percent work forty percent people management as you go on the top you can't learn that you know it's you can learn about people management you learn about world politics. But the key depth knowledge, okay, is in your primary year. So if you don't have that attitude to learn, you don't have the curiosity, okay, you can never uh, be a good uh, manager for future. So I think that's the main thing, attitude, attitude. That's, for me, that's the main thing. Thanks, Ali. I, I'll never forget my first conversation with uh, Ali Habib right after I accepted this position at the university. I asked you know, I asked Ash, I said, you know, what is your vision for or hope for Habib University? And he said that, you know, in Pakistan, we're, we, we produce very cap technically capable engineers. That's not the problem. The problem is they can, they, they, they can rarely see beyond, you know, one inch beyond their, you know, their, the training that they've had. Uh, and so he was really, that was his hope and dream for Habib. And I, and I think we are fulfilling that. But Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Aisha, uh, Acumen runs some wonderful leadership programs uh, in Pakistan and around the world, and, and um, I, I wanted to get, you know, your thoughts on what kind of uh, education best sets up students for effective and successful leadership. Yeah, you know, I think we all have this rather romantic notion of leadership as these highly charismatic individuals who are out there orating beautifully and dispensing these very quotable nuggets into a very adoring public. But, you know, in reality, and really the most robust sort of leadership is a very 
deeply insightful process of understanding a community, being within that community, being able to actually move various parts of that community in a way that the sum is greater than its parts. So whether you're a corporate leader or a political leader or a leader in any, any small way, you need to start really with this deep understanding of what is it that you're trying to do? What is the change you're trying to affect and why? And so when we go into what is required in order to get to that, how do you start even asking the why before you actually get to the what? I really go back, and, and by the way, I should admit that I have spent six years, six years at a business school, so probably you know, uh, getting a doctorate, but asking the why I think is really grounded in going back to the basics. Um, you know, so many of the great canonical texts that we have in front of us, and you can refer to them from the Western canon and the Eastern canon. We have our books, the holy books that are very important. I think everyone should read them and figure out the lessons. But learning from not just the philosophers of the West, which is you have your Plato, Socrates, Marcus Aurelius, but you have a whole Eastern canon as well, Confucius, Ibn Khaldun, you have Ibn Sina. And so going back to what has been done before and understanding that in order to articulate your why, to understand how communities function, how individuals work, how do you figure out your own motivation? So it's a deep journey of first just going out and seeing what's out there, but then a lot of introspection on figuring out what is your own why? Why do you want to lead? What do you bring to the table that is uh, going to actually bring everyone else up? And ultimately it's an act of service. It's not an act of pulling yourself up over everyone else, but it's deeply, deeply grounded in community and service. So starting with that is really what would set you up for leadership. Right, and I, and I know that Acumen is, has really places a lot of emphasis on on moral paths of leadership as, a, as an important uh, you know, dimension of this. And I, I couldn't agree with more with you about um, you know, being in touch with, uh, with the roots, so to speak. And, and at, 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 at Habib, we offer this wonderful course called Hikma as part of the core, where they do read Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Rushd and Avicenna and Al-Ghazali and, and uh, Ibn al-Arabi and all sorts of great thinkers. Um, and I try to remind them that you know, there, you know, Muslim thinkers were, were reading Plato and, and Socrates and Aristotle long before anybody in the West was reading them. So I don't think those are just Western, Western, uh, Western thinkers. Um, Nether, uh, let me ask you what kind of education um, uh, you think uh, we need in, in order to create sort of capable, able leaders in the future. So must do the obligatory Mia Kalpa also have MBA, but uh, Anybody here have an arts degree? <laughs> so I'll, uh, but but I'll, I'll I'll try to answer your your question with a bit of a personal anecdote. Right. So you know I I went MIT did nuclear engineering for five years hardcore engineering. So MIT used to have a requirement you had to take eight humanities eight wow. humanities. And so I, I got the opportunity to study Islamic literature, where I discovered I discovered Rumi. Uh, uh, you know, I, I got to study sociology. I did a concentration in economics, so I can read anything in the Wall Street Journal well before my MBA and actually understand what they were talking about. Uh, and so I, I got to do those things. And at the end of the day, if you ask me today, so quantum thermodynamics, I don't really remember. But you know how the how GDP works and the 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 the, the Stoic uh, philosophy of Islam that comes from the Sufism set and and how that relates to our modern life and how that is in contrast with consumerism as we experience it every day. Those are things that I relate to more and more, uh, perhaps at, towards the latter part of my career than than what the fundamental skill sets were. Mm -hmm. But I think mm -hmm. the the and, and we, in, especially in Pakistan, where we get very, very concentrated very, very early, um, I think we, we do our young people a disservice where we don't expose them to the arts or the humanities or history for that matter, <laughs> unfiltered history. Um, uh, and I think that's really, really important. I mean, 
I learned more about the history of Pakistan when I had left Pakistan than when I did here, because the stuff that was taught here was cookie cutter, sanitized version of a political view that wanted to be presented. But how confusing and, and how Jinnah was the reluctant leader who absolutely never wanted to go down that path. And he only went down it when all doors were closed to him. These are only things I learned when I was outside of the ecosystem and I had access to unfiltered history. Uh, and of course, you know, I'm dating myself, but this is pre-internet where I, you didn't have access to this information uh, if you were in Pakistan. So I think it's really, really important that if we are to create, and it's not just employees or leaders, if we're just to, to create good citizens, that they have a holistic view of the world and they see the world for what it is. And our education systems in Pakistan just do that a great disservice. I mean, the curricula that we generally run are incredibly managed, sanitized versions of what really happened. And if for some reason it serves a political agenda or whatever you, you may have, but at the end of the day, I mean, questioning aside, that's up. You know, we've all talked about that, that, you know, you, you have to question. Questioning aside, just the quality of the curricula that's on offer um, is, is incredibly limited in its scope and gets tighter and tighter the moment you hit tertiary education. It gets very, very tight. And, and so, as, as I think Aisha was pointing out, we're, we're, uh, or, uh, or Aisha Mahim pointed out, that we're producing subpar technical specialists. And that, that's not a recipe to, to, to be able to serve in life, just, uh, just in life, let alone for, for, an, uh, for, uh, for a company or if you want to succeed from that perspective. And I think that's, that's where the biggest gap, just having a better curricula where you learn about life and the world as we find it, uh, and, and that only comes with taking a broader view. We're taking a broader view. You know, even in the British system, right? So in O levels, you have to have a minimum of six subjects. Most people have 10 or so, 10 or 11 in levels. You have, you have to have a minimum of three and people take four. And then you go to university for three years for specialization. That's the British system because they at least gave you a broad uh, grounding earlier on. I think in, in most of the education systems that are available in Pakistan, we, we're not really doing that. Or if we're doing it, we're paying lip service to it. Um, you know, I, I, I took in, in O levels, I took O level biology. And, and the things that I learned there still stick with me today. So when a doctor writes me a prescription or I open the medicines and I kind of try, you know, I can see little knowledge is a very dangerous thing. But, but you know, you, I can at least kind of figure out why it's happening or I like to ask the question, why are you giving me this? And the answer that he gives me, I can at least understand, which makes me a more willing patient. Uh, going to a doctor is not exactly, you know, top on anyone's priority list of things to do. But I think that's, if that, I, we're only able to do that because we had broad exposure. And if we just had narrow exposure to just a narrow set of subjects, and that even not particularly well done, then then we are failing in educating our young people. And that's, I mean, I, you know, one of the great thrills uh, I've had here in Pakistan is in when I when I get in the classroom and teach, I'm just amazed when you, as, as we do, because we don't offer any sanitized versions of anything here at the Beep, uh, and and just how critical the students are in, in their thinking and and how active and engaged and and excited they are about. Um, about ideas. Um, Naveed, let me um, ask you, you're in a notoriously fast-paced um, and very high-pressure um, industry where thinking on your feet is, uh, you know, thinking quickly on your feet is, is essential to success. Um, so what kind of education is, is, you know, essential for success in, in your line of work? Well, you're absolutely right about it being fast-paced and extreme high pressure. I mean, there's never a dull moment, but I'll just come to media in a minute. I just feel that, you know, the, the critical important issues in this is to consider is that the apex body responsible for the regulation of higher education in the country, the Higher Education Commission or HEC as we call it, it actually claims to have a mission. And that is that to facilitate institutions of higher education to serve as engines of socio-economic development for Pakistan. I mean, wow. After going through that and other things on their website, I was left wondering, where is the part about critical thinking? 
Where is the part about lateral diligence? What about inference? What about leadership? You know, it, it reflects a very elementary, basic thought process from literally the previous century, which they successfully end up making very laboriously, you know, unidimensional. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that is mirrored in the educated workforce to a great extent. Mm -hmm. Now, having been part of the electronic media landscape since the mid 90s, besides, of course, that makes me feel like a dinosaur, but it also makes me happy to notice that we have at least moved to a stage where media is being considered as a proper career option. Maybe not as one of the top five lucrative career options, but at least it's come a long way from the times when it was considered one of the last sort of resorts after all other choices have been exhausted. Uh, for the longest of times academically, the mass communication department of Karachi University sort of served as a safe haven for all career aspirants in media. Now, of course, there are bachelor degrees in media related studies being offered by you know, at least a dozen universities. The Center for Journalism, the Center for Excellence in Journalism, CEJ at the IPA, even offers a master's program in journalism. However, that holistic approach is, is still found wanting in, in the vast majority of graduates. Empathy, you know, it's, it's something so critical in journalism. So is the ability to sort of communicate effectively without coming across as self-virtuous. Mm -hmm anchors or correspondents or, or anyone who's news gathering, you know, constantly need to be checked to refrain from crossing over to becoming either televangelists or, you know, resorting to moral policing. The prime job of a news organization is to highlight a particular issue and raise pertinent questions. It is not our job to become tools, you know, in the process of either making or breaking governments. It is not our job to become part of the process of certifying what is right and what is wrong as far as moralities are concerned. And it is not our job to impart verdicts on what is religiously correct or even ethically wrong. And this constantly needs to be imbibed by all those who are either part of the media or those who wish to be a part of the media in the future. And on a lighter note, all it takes is to remember some very simple but effective advice from a childhood comic hero with great power comes great responsibility. Never thought I'd be quoting Spider-Man at an education center. <laughs> Thanks, Nivi. Uh, and I, you know, we're, we're really excited about our new uh, communication design program, which I think will be a real, a, a real pathbreaker here in, uh, in Pakistan. Um, let me go on to the third question, which is uh, that, uh, and, and Aisha, I'd like to start with you. Um, Pakistan has a, a significant youth bulge. It's currently the uh, fifth uh, largest country in the world and, and will probably surpass Indonesia in the next uh, decade or so. Um, and yet it has a flagging economy. Um, how can um, leaders in, in each of the industries that you represent partner more effectively with educational institutions such as Habib um, to nurture the kind of young talent that um, Pakistan will need uh, to become prosperous as we move towards Pakistan 100. Yeah, Chris, I'm so glad you asked this because uh, this is one of the most critical issues facing Pakistan. I mean, we have a whole set of critical issues to address and look at, but this is amongst the most serious ones that we're imminently facing. And to really just put the problem in full color, look, two out of three Pakistanis are under 30 right now, roughly. And um, when you look at that, that's a population of 220 million, two out of three are young and under 30. Mostly they're not educated or ill-educated, mostly they're in rural areas. Add to that the fact that our population growth rate is still 2.7% and our GDP growth rate is either half that or less. So you really are left with this fundamental, you know, kind of mismatch between what we can offer our young people and this whole mass of young people entering. So every year about, I think it's 4 million young people enter the workforce and they need one and a half million new jobs and we're not really creating any. So what happens when we don't create these jobs and you leave this large youth bulge vulnerable to all sorts of things, to being disenfranchised, that's a very basic one but then you're also vulnerable to extremism and all sorts of things that are not going to push Pakistan towards any positive path. In fact, it's something that can possibly destroy us in a real, real and very immediate, imminent way. So 
this is a critical issue and I feel like if we don't work together and address it, unless we figure out the problem of how do we leverage our youth and make this a strength, this will determine whether Pakistan succeeds or doesn't succeed in the next couple of decades. And so going back to what we can do, I think we've been touching upon the first question you asked was about the type of education that is required in order to train the right workforce. That is the right workforce for this country. And actually, really, we're more and more in, you know, I think Friedman said it ages ago, like the world is flat. There's a whole global war for skills and talent. And we've missed almost every revolution that has come, the industrial, the, you know, IT. But in this one, how do we, how do we tap onto this and create really, really high value individuals who are able to then push and create things for the future and to sustain Pakistan. So that's one, we really need to figure out how to get the education model right. And in that it is not that educational institutions should be serving corporates or what you know financial institutions want or you know what I need or Engro needs or whatever, but there has to be some connection between the skills that are required in industry that are required for us to produce what we need to produce and what is being provided by the education sector. So really having that really clear conversation, the fact that every single one of the individuals on this panel said, we're not finding the right people here easily. This is a hard thing, means that there is massive room for improvement here. So that's, that's one collaboration. I think the second one, which is an obvious one, is we need to find employment opportunities. And so how do each and every one of us figure out how do you encourage entrepreneurship? Because with entrepreneurship, not only are you providing employment to an individual, but then there's a multiplier effect because they create successful enterprises that in turn generate employment. So, you know, the government has been doing things like Kamyat, Najavan, and so on and so forth. And whether they land well or don't land well is something we can debate later on. But I think for each of us who are running and, and you know, people on this panel, others who may be listening, it's so important that we create the space where we can start incubating entrepreneurial ventures, even within what we're doing, and create the supporting system, whether we're mentoring or providing financial support or just, you know, kind of championing from a distance. This absolutely needs to happen. And as I said, unless we get this right, we're just you know, but it's not going to be a youth bulge. I think someone was calling it the youth bomb as well. So we really need to be on the right side of this. Thanks, Aisha. Um, Nether, what, what, what kind of linkages um, between your industry and, and universities would be effective or helpful? You're, uh, sorry, your mic's off, yep. Thank you. No, thank you, Chris. Um, I think what's really important here is we kind of revisit the business model both for ourselves, how we recruit, and for higher education and how it trains. Um, so, you know, if, if you look at what Google and Apple and et cetera are doing, they're saying you don't need a university uh, course anymore. Here's a, uh, an online module, six months worth of work that we think, if you can do this and you pass the, the exams on this, you have a job with us. And I think, I mean, in some ways, that's a, that's a six month long education based assessment center. And I think there is a lot of merit in that. Um, and because at the end of the day, higher education is, is shorthand, right? It's shorthand. So somebody's taught you the basic skills. You have a degree from Habib University or IBA or LUMS. It's shorthand that the basics are there. Now let's see what else you've got. And we try to figure that out in interviews and so forth, which is an incredibly imprecise process. So I, I think there is, um, and so there is part where we as we as rec recruiters of large scale employment and talent need to kind of revisit our model. And I think on the education side, I mean, if, if I were to go rogue and go off script here, um, you know, it, it's we're applying for higher education is essentially a 16th century business model to a 21st century problem, right? So universities have operated the same way since they were founded uh, four, 400 years ago. And it's a bricks and mortars model. Come to our class, we will teach you, we will have great teachers, they will teach you, you will learn, and then you will get certified. And I think that model in itself is, is inevitably gonna get disrupted massively. 
and with what's happened with COVID and how we are communicating today and how uh, higher universities, uh, I mean, uh, universities abroad are operating where kids are still in Pakistan, but they're attending class in the UK or the US. I think this model is going to fundamentally change. And that really needs to be brought in where technology will massively lower your cost to serve. So my understanding is Pakistan has about 25 million people in, in, uh, in, 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 you know, who, in secondary school and barely a million seven make it to, to tertiary education. So of course, these are economic factors, et cetera. But clearly th that pipeline got really, really constricted really quickly. And part of it is outreach, right? Habib University can only serve so many students. And I think designing programs whereby the universities use technology so they can lower their cost to serve and have a much higher pool. And then perhaps some tailoring on how that pool for the skill sets that particular organizations want would be an incredibly symbiotic relationship. But essentially, our, for, so the, the youth bomb that Aisha refers to, the only way we, we try to address that is if we enlarge the, the pool of people who actually get to tertiary education, uh, who get to a university level education. Um, because if we don't do that, then they are going to have substandard skills and, and Pakistan just com continues to lag. So I think from the universities, essentially, much greater use of technology to then lower their cost to serve, you know, Harvard's done it and, and others where there's edX out there and there's Coursera out there. But bringing that kind of experience so that lowers your cost to serve so you can address a much larger pool and then building content in working with employers like ourselves and others uh, on this call and who are listening. So content gets tailored so that, that then employees hit the ground running in, in companies that they join. Thanks, Nader. And I, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that you know, the, the, that's the big takeaway for me from the pandemic has been it's really opened the eyes of higher education to the potential of, of technology and, and the, you know, a small liberal arts university like Habib. Before the pandemic, I think we sort of looked at, at online learning and said, what does that have to offer us? And that's not what we do. Uh, but then we learned really fast and we doubled down. And, and, and I think that going forward right now, we're really kind of assessing the lessons from the pandemic and, and what, how this is gonna change our uh, business model going forward. Uh, Mohsen, let, let me ask you the view from your um, industry. So, so Chris, this is actually a very interesting, uh, appropriate question that you have put to all of us, and it's actually quite a difficult question as well. And before I answer that question, I want to refer to your um, opening comment, which you made, which was that 85% of the jobs uh, by 2030, we don't even know what the jobs, what those jobs are going to be. So essentially, how do we train our younger generation for something that we don't even know about? If, if you really try and put this in perspective, it's quite a quite an intimidating uh, situation to be in. How do we prepare our next generation? So I think two broad things I would say. First of all is that it again comes back to the point that we have all been making, that there is a lot of need for uh, developing people from a more critical thinking perspective. Mm -hmm. What critical thinking is going to do is to give them the ability, hopefully, to adapt and go through a lot of new learning as the dynamics evolve, because obviously we don't know what we're talking about in 10, 15, 20 years time. So I think the critical thinking aspect will equip them much better for new learning and being adaptive to what that environment will demand. Um, the second thing I would say is then again, to a little bit touching upon what Nadir was saying, uh, rather than going back 400 years, how universities operated, and we had a set curriculum for different courses, I think there is a far greater need for the educational institutions and the industries to collaborate and connect. We as a banking industry should provide a lot of feedback to the education universities as to what we need, what we look at from students who join the banks. And therefore the education institutions can take that input in preparing the, the courses or the curriculum accordingly because it helps develop the students in that direction. And I'm not only referring to banking, I'm just saying banking can provide its own input and the other in, uh, industries would provide their own input. So that collaborative effort is very, very critical. If the universities are going to operate independently or in a silo without taking any feedback, 
from the workforce and the industry and the employers, then I think we're headed for a significant disaster. So, so the collaboration is becoming increasingly more important. Uh, another uh, segment that I would add to uh, is that even within our industry, for example, there is a need for us to talk amongst ourselves and through specific banking institutes, we need to come up and train people accordingly as well on what we are seeing as the emerging key themes from a futuristic perspective, be it digital, be it other things. So I think there is a completely different mindset required uh, to prepare this education uh, curriculum than what we've all been used to uh, a few decades ago. Thanks, Mohsen. Um, Navid, what's your, what's your view? Uh, so, uh, uh, sorry, it's, 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 sorry, I thought he I mean, said Naveed. Say Naveed or Ali? Naveed, Naveed, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I also heard Ali. So. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The news media, I, I guess a very natural sort of strategic tie-up would be, you know, the affiliation of an education institution with the media house for an extended internship program that becomes part of the academic curriculum. I guess media houses too sort of need to think some out of the box solutions of how to incorporate fresh graduates, both in front as well as behind the camera. I personally am familiar with the fact that a number of media houses express some sort of reliance as high at that stage of the career. But as mentioned earlier, the two part of your population is that it's safe with prior tested norms is not even an option. Anymore core sort of values and more than importantly the consequences are inculcated at the educational institutional level as well as the organizational structure and it needs consistent reinforcement because there is just no quick fix solution to it as far as you know the societal issues and the collective impact and national character are concerned i guess that requires a sort of a rigorous a patient and very long-term strategy whether it is the issue of socio-political polarization in our society or the complete absence of tolerance in the everyday discourse or the ease with which we sort of, you know, discard any form of discipline from our lives, all these factors sort of contribute towards stagnating the element of prosperity on a national level. Coupled with political infusion from those who are truly in power, this results in scenes like we saw barely 10 days ago, scenes which were ugly, which were tragic, which were blood boiling, and most of all, very frustrating because deep down, I think we all know that this wasn't the first time these things happened, but unfortunately, it was also not the last time these things will happen. All right. Thanks, Navid. Um, Seema, what's your perspective? So I think I'm going to be a little bit contrarian again. <laughs> um, two aspects to this. One, you know, we think, okay, the world is completely changed. Uh, and now we don't know what the jobs will be in 30 years. And yes, that may be true. Uh, but the world has also completely changed from 100 years ago. So there is something to be said for first principles. And, and first principles is something that in any educational environment, we are neglecting. So people have, in, in our country, have lost that ability to rely on first principles to guide them. Yes, we faced an industrial revolution and the world is entirely different to what it was hundred years ago. And in 30 years, it will be entirely different. And the jobs that come about will be entirely different. Yes, but we faced that before. And so I think, um, you know, there, this whole fear that what, what is going to happen now has happened before. And so I think, um, it's important to realize that and to, and to not kind of panic. So that's one aspect that I would like to highlight. Um, the other thing I would like to talk about is your, the collaboration between uh, employers and particularly large employers and, uh, and educational institutions. You know, we always talk about it. It's got to go beyond the lip service. There's just too much lip service in, in all of this, right? So we talk about it and the state bank, for example, is, is there's two parts to it. There's the operational bit and the core state bank is really a knowledge organization, right? We work with knowledge on, largely. And, um, and yes, we talk about collaborating with 
educational institution. So we will talk about it today. We will write about it, but then we will go and do nothing. Right. And we were, and everybody has said very, have been very uh, articulate and have said very beautiful things, but we need to go beyond that really. So if we're going to do something, then we have to go ahead and actually do it. And I think that's where the, the gap lies. Of course, we must collaborate. But then, you know, what's going to happen? We will go away from the session. We will go back and do our jobs again. Mm -hmm. uh, so unless someone takes a real lead on this, we just go on in, in the way that we are. So I think, and where does that onus actually lie? Mm -hmm. Does it lie with, with the government to some degree? Does it lie with large organizations like us? Yes, it does. Does it lie with you? or the academia, yes. But I think we have to go beyond the beautiful words and the lovely quotes and all of that and actually do something because this youth bulge, if you start educating someone who was born today, you have to go through it for 20 years to make any difference at all. And not only do we not educate them or we educate them in very narrow ways, many of them are stunted, malnutrition. They're not even able to learn, let alone anything else. So I think we have to, we have to tackle this in a way that is beyond the words. So that's really the two things I would like to say. And if anyone really has a passion for this, then they really have to take it up. And it's got to be beyond webinars. Right. Thanks, Seema. That's Really, really poignant. Um, Ali, uh, Indus um, does reach out to students at various levels, um, but I'm wondering if you think that there is still room for improvement um, even, even there. You're muted, sorry. Yeah, so I think this uh, word improvement is, you know, it's built in our DNA, right? So uh, the basic, uh, Two pillars of Toyota is, is one is uh, uh, Kaizen, which is continuous improvement. So there's always room for improvement. So in anything and everything we do. Um, you know, while we've been discussing about, um, about our youth, we also need to be mindful, okay, of what will happen in the future, right? One is obviously you're talking about higher education. How many people will take higher education? Majority people, okay, after metric or inter, okay, they look for jobs. So somebody has to even think, you see, on a broader vision, the government has a good education system, okay, that's a long-term view, they do it, and we have a generation uh, going to higher education, okay, but meanwhile, we have to work on this aspect also. So for many, many years, what uh, we do is, as, as Indus Motors, as Toyota, that we take fresh, fresh, fresh intermediates, and we have a training program. Um, so before we put anybody on the line, uh, we put them into this three months training program. Um, this three months training program teaches them how to ask the question, the five why, right? So they open up the horizon, of what, how to think. Um, it's been a dream, and it was a dream of uh, our late chairman Ali Habib. To, make, to have so much supply of these people, because for many, many years, we bring a batch, um, we train them, and we consume them, because there's a lot of attrition in Pakistan, because a lot of people come uh, and join us thinking, oh, it's Toyota, okay, so they will have a, maybe a, a nice sofa, a nice chair, and I have a sofa, but they have to work on the line, right? Um, so they were almost attrition, but we are very happy, because when we train them, We've trained them into these aspects of how to ask the right questions, um, continuous improvement, the safety standards. For whatever work they do, okay, that's the limited training is going there. Now, for future, what we want to do is keep on hiring, okay, and come to a point, okay, where we have more supply and we give them a certificate, which is a Toyota certificate trained in, in this uh, aspect and then we can, this is how we want to contribute to the society. Uh, all these people that have left, 
uh, also that they go then they go into UAE. Obviously, they have better opportunities. But we have to have two fold strategies. One is okay, actually three fold. There are people who are not getting education, so we need to get them basic education. Then there are people who are getting the basic education, how to get them jobs. And then there are people who want to move from the basic education to higher education. So I think there's a there's a three term approach. At least we are trying in the second bit, which is once they get the basic education, metric or intermediate, how to get their mind open and how to make them more skillful. So I think that's what uh, how we want we are and we will contribute to the society of Pakistan. Thanks, Ali. Mahin, I'm going to give you the last um, the last word on this one. Uh, what are your thoughts? And if I can sum up what I'm generally hearing in the room, um, I think I'm also going to say, say something again, a little bit contrarian. I think we've talked about, you know, the, the demographic bomb that's sitting there. I think the thing is also that young people are not, it, it's not all about handling young people and giving them jobs to do. Uh, if you harness the positive energy of young people appropriately, then you can bring a sea change in the way um, society functions and the way um, you know, the contribution that they can make to economic growth. So I think the challenge that everyone is highlighting is how do we bring that positive energy uh, and harness it towards a better good? Um, and I don't think that that is any one person. It's not up to the government alone or education institutions alone or corporates alone. It has to be done in a collaborative effort to try and address the market failures that currently exist in Pakistan. When we look at universities, we've talked about how curriculum is becoming irrelevant to today's context. So I think universities and colleges and schools need to go and think about how to make um, their content relevant to today's world. It's a digital world. We have children in China who in primary school are learning about coding and robotics. And here we don't have those options except for the you know very select few so is this something that should be brought into primary school um, type of education uh, when we talk about universities how can we move beyond university financing uh, you know sort of constraints and move them away from donor funded and fee funded models into actually building their balance sheets so that their outreach uh can be wider whether it is in the form of digital or other campuses so you know this is something universities uh, have to think about because let's face it habib university's competition in an online format is not lungs or iba it is now harvard because if a child can log in um into an online course then they will pick whatever is the best out there available to them um, at the same time when we talk about corporates I guarantee you that you know the one million people that are entering the workforce there's a fraction of that going into the corporate world um and and we are certainly not producing enough jobs to accommodate that so what you have left is the entrepreneurship and the small business which is very much the informal sector and and how do we as corporates fill in the gaps required to encourage that one big piece is the funding element the access to finance um, and this is something that uh, banks have struggled with. This is something, you know, the, the entire government has struggled. How do we get finance across to small, medium enterprises, to entrepreneurs? And, and that's something we should sit down and see how we can break that, uh, that cycle. The other side is also the, the comparative difficulty in operating in the formal structure in Pakistan, uh, the rules, the regulations, how can we get help across to those who want to start businesses or work in small businesses to make it easier for them to do that? So I think these are just some uh, ideas of initial collaboration that I'm sure that uh, you know, if it comes down to actually sitting down and saying, how can we address, it's gonna be small changes. We can't do this overnight. But incrementally, as individuals, as professionals, um, and as representatives of the institutions that we run, we are going to have to come together and uh, find solutions well beyond, as, as Seema said, what this webinar can offer. Great. Thanks, Maheen. And, and thank, I'd like to thank all of you uh, this evening for um, really enriching. Wasif started a great uh, conversation, and all of you have really enriched of that conversation with your uh, your contributions tonight, uh, I am left with Seema's challenging question of how do we move beyond conversations and webinars and and uh, into the realm of action and what is the right catalyst? And I, I don't have an answer for that, but I hope that all of us can um, you know will 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 think about how do we move beyond the webinar 
to uh, to the phase of action and and uh, and and what is the best catalyst for that? So once again, I'd like to thank you all for um, for being with us this evening and for um, sharing your your valuable time and thoughts um, with us. And I'd like to wish everybody uh, for the hafiz, uh, and thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.